What if, just what if your institution had an embedded structured initiative to help faculty promote themselves? You know, something to really, really boost the employer brand. Well, Maya Demishkovich has an idea. She's doing it and we'll talk about it on this episode of I Want to Work There. Welcome to I Want to Work There, a podcast that helps colleges and universities boost their brand as employers of choice. I'm your host, Eddie Francis, brand strategy consultant for Edify Ventures. Join me every other week for discussions with some of the best minds in talent recruitment and retention, human resources, and marketing and communications inside and outside of higher education. I Want to Work There is part of the Enrollify Network, a robust collection of podcasts designed to help higher education professionals just like you grow and explore our other shows at enrollify.org or check out some of my personal favorites linked in the show notes below enrollify is made possible by element 451 the leading ai powered all-in-one student engagement platform helping institutions create meaningful personalized and engaging interactions with students learn more at element451.com Joining me on I Want to Work There is one of my colleagues, one of my great colleagues, Maya Demishkovich. She is the chief marketing officer at Carroll Community College in Maryland. Also, she's the host of the Hidden Gem podcast here on the Enrollify Network. I have to do it. It is an Enrollify crossover. Bah, bah, bah. <laughs> Maya, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Eddie? I'm doing good. So I'm talking to Maya as I love to talk to my colleagues I have an idea that I want to talk to Maya about on the podcast, but Maya says, no, I have a better idea. <laughs> I'm taking over, Eddie. She, <laughs> took, she took over my podcast planning, and I'm glad she did it because, you know, throughout the season, I have taken this three-pronged approach to employer branding and higher education. I've looked at talent attraction, talent experience, and talent retention and here comes Maya with this fantastic talent experience idea that she floated past me, a way to train faculty to boost basically their employer brands, a practice of academic branding. Let's get into it. So Maya, tell me about this. Tell me about academic branding and how did you get interested in it in the first place? Yeah. Well, thanks, Eddie, for being open to switching topics and talking about something else. I do hope that your listeners enjoy this conversation because I am very passionate about this. And I got into academic branding and how to leverage faculty and staff to amplify the institution's visibility while I was doing my doctoral study. Because at that time, I was also working as a brand manager for a for-profit online university. And I realized that having a strong presence and a well-rounded portfolio could open doors for me for teaching at the college level and to different research opportunities. And that's what I wanted to do after I completed my doctoral study. And as a brand manager, I knew that having professors at my institution be positioned as thought leaders and having increased visibility can really help me strengthen and amplify the institutional brand. And also before I got into academia, I started my career as a search engine marketer. So I did a lot of digital marketing and that experience taught me that if you're not visible, you are invisible. <laughs> you mm. pretty much don't mm. exist, right? Especially with search engines. If somebody is searching for your name or an area of expertise that you want to be well known for, and they don't see your name, I mean, no one is going to find you and talk to you and offer research opportunities and funding and et cetera, or media coverage. So with that kind of knowledge in hand, I started learning more about academic branding and how to build my own brand. And then I was also helping other academics and doctoral students to enhance their profiles. So I helped them with building their personal websites and creating positioning statements and consulting them on how to do social media to promote their research and how to talk about their research in a way that's more engaging and more interesting and not just like a research paper uploaded to LinkedIn. You know? <laughs> and I got really passionate about this and I have applied it in other ways. 
I did go into teaching and I got a position teaching, but I didn't stay. Ultimately, I decided that marketing was more fun <laughs> and I returned to working at higher education institution. But so what is academic branding? So academic branding is very similar to a concept of personal branding, which many people are familiar with, except it accounts for different intricacies of academia. So people in academia have different goals. They have social and professional norms that are slightly different than like people in business world, right? And those in higher education are already prolific creators of work within their field. They're active in publishing and teaching and mentoring and presenting and committee work. So they already have this content that they can share. But what I found is many of those researchers and faculty members and professors, they're experts in their field, but they don't know much about communication or social media or how to present themselves, or how to build websites. So I do believe that institutions who can assist their researchers and faculty with building their academic brand can really benefit. It could be a win-win situation for both employees and the institution. I am really curious as to how faculty react when you start this conversation with them? I think it depends on the faculty, but right. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I did at my institution later on. But I found that I work at a community college and many faculty members did not necessarily see themselves as thought leaders. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they're like, well, what do I have to say? Who is going <laughs> to be listening to me? Why should even they be following me? And I tried to explain to them that you are experts in your field and you know a lot more than you think you do. And people do want to know and you have a lot of experience. And don't think about about it as positioning yourself as a thought leader. Think about it as sharing your experience, sharing what's happening in your daily life, maybe an insight you gained or an interesting study you read or the research you're working on. So think about it, it's almost like a journal, like almost like sharing your thoughts and ideas. And people do find it very interesting, surprisingly to them, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) to faculty and staff. So it's kind of shifting their mindset from and starting to see themselves as, yes, I do have experience. And yes, I do have something to say and share. And yes, people are interested in reading what I have to say. And it's, it's a learning curve in the beginning. It takes some time to get into this. But over time, I think it becomes easier for them. I ask that question because I, I, you know, when I was doing Marcom, I was getting the same reaction from Mm. faculty. But I also got the other end of the spectrum where you have the faculty who believe that everybody needed to hear everything that they need that they have to say about something, which is good as well because. I, I, it's just really interesting to me that one of the things that I I really experienced running into, and, and I actually spoke to someone who does this kind of work independently with faculty, personal branding type work. And she said, you know, the imposter syndrome that I see in a mm-hmm. lot of faculty a lot of times, yes. she said, I is, is the hardest part of my work is getting them over that hump so that mm-hmm. they can mm-hmm. share what they are doing publicly. And I'm sitting here listening to it going, but these are some of the people, when I watch the news and I'm listening to folks and just kind of spitball a topic, I'm sitting there going, can we please get an academic on this? Can we please get somebody from somebody's institution who is mm-hmm. an expert in this to talk about this? Because I don't want to hear this person spitball about this really important issue, you know, with millions of people watching. And so I'm one of those people who, when I really started to get acquainted with the kind of work that faculty were doing, I got really excited about it. And in some cases, Maya, I felt like I was more excited than they were about it. (laughs) And I'm sitting there going, no, 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 no. Everybody needs to hear this stuff that you're talking about right now. Right. But but that, that resistance was something that I found to be really interesting with a lot of the faculty that I talked to. Yeah, I guess that's the same thing that I'm observing. And I think it may be about the more you know, the less you think you know. <laughs> like once you know so much, you start 
doubting yourself. Or is it that you just exist in that world? Like you're so insulated in that world. Maybe, maybe that's just it. And you're thinking to yourself, well, this is what I teach. It's not all that interesting. This is for students. This isn't necessarily that the public wants to. I'm wondering if it's that kind of thought process too sometimes. I think that that too. Like once you like in it, you think everybody knows it. Well, right? that's true. Yeah. And, but it's the same with me too. Like I have been doing marketing for so long and very often I talk to someone and they're like, well, what does it mean? And I assume, right, that everybody knows it. <laughs> <laughs> so we all, all, all do. And I think that faculty and researchers uh, do the same. And some believe that, well, I did this work, I published it on, like, let's say in a publication and then people have to find it. Yeah. They just, they just have to. Yes. They'll somehow find it. <laughs> Yes. And it's not the case, right? Yes, yes. So you mentioned it being a benefit to the institution and to the employee. And and of course, you know, we definitely want institutions to feel that there is the benefit that there for them as well. So what does that look like for institutions in addition to the employees? Right. right. So I see that there is a lot of benefits. The first one being amplifying visibility and reach. So in a way, you are tapping into your employees' network. And every time they share, every time they post, every time they go on an interview with a media outlet, they mention your institution, and that increases your reach and more people hear the name of your institution. Plus, on social media, individuals are more likely to have more followers than brands, right? And mm -hmm. the engagement on personal profiles is usually much higher than on company profiles. So the second benefit would be increased trust. People really trust leaders who are active on social media and who are visible on social media. Uh, it's kind of the idea, the more you see someone, the more you get used to them, the more you get to know them, and you almost feel like it's your best buddy, even though you've never met them. But yeah, it does help build trust through that individual who is sharing their research and mentioning maybe even indirectly, the name of your institution. I also think that it can help influence talent acquisition because the first mm -hmm. place new employees go to is social media, right? Or they mm -hmm. go to the website of the company. And if they see happy, engaged employees who are sharing about their research, sharing about their work at the institution, there's even research done that said, 58% more likely to attract top talent. Mm. So it can help enhance your employer brand. And that's your whole podcast is employer ding, branding. Ding, 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 ding. That's what we <laughs> like to hear here. That's what we like yep. to hear on I Want to Work There. Thank you so and much. Another way is having your faculty and staff and professors active can open doors to different partnerships and opportunities because they might start a conversation with someone on social media who's looking for something that your institution can provide. So it can create those opportunities and collaborations that benefit both the individual and the institution. Of course, it can lead to increased media presence, right? If somebody is searching for an expert and they come across your faculty member because your website is so well optimized and it has a great profile highlighting that particular individual, Media people are not going to look for somebody else because they already found it. They'll reach out, they ask a testimonial or a quote. And I also think that's a very cost-effective way to increase publicity and visibility of your institution because you are empowering your employees to be ambassadors on their behalf and the behalf of your institution. So that's the benefits for the company. But I also think there are a lot of benefits for employees as well. So... Increased visibility is one, mm -hmm. right? So if they become more well-known and positioned as subject matter experts, they have higher influence. And if they're applying for grants or yeah. writing a proposal, they can include that on their proposal and say, hey, this is where I was featured. This is my online social media presence, whatever. <clears throat> so it gives you a lot more leverage it's a great professional development. So every time you go and speak at a conference or maybe you do a podcast or a webinar around the topic of your expertise, 
you meet other people, you exchange ideas. If you are active on social media, you follow other experts and it helps you broaden your network and broaden your worldview and see what people mm -hmm. are talking about. Research and other collaboration opportunities can open up to those who, are, who have a more built up academic brand. If it's a faculty member or let's say a program director, it can help them increase enrollment in their programs yeah. at the institution. If somebody is looking for consulting opportunities, you know, it can also help. I talked about funding and industry partnerships. So I do see this as a win-win opportunity for, for both. Mm -hmm. really. You're listening to I Want to Work There. I'm Eddie Francis, and we're talking to Maya Demiskovich. She is the Chief Marketing Officer at Carroll Community College, also the host of the Hidden Gem Podcast here on the Enrollify Network. And so I, as I was thinking about this, and I ran across the same thing where I last worked at Dillard University, as a matter of fact, when I started working at Dillard, you know, one of our one of the guests on this podcast, Walter Kimbrough, the hip hop prez, was the president. And it was so funny. There was this perception that he wanted all of the limelight for himself. But he pulled me in his office <laughs> my first day of work and he said, I need the faculty to get out there. I need them to I need them to get out there. Their faces. They are the face of this institution. They need to be out there. And the first the the first thought that a lot of folks had was traditional terrestrial media. The first thought was, well, how are we going to get all these people on TV? And I'm going, they don't all have to be on television and they don't all have to be on local television stations. We can put them anywhere we want to put them. And you're going to love this. Hopefully I'll make your SEO heart sing when I say this. But my thought was, you know, we have a whole website that we really, really need to use as home base for media. That's where the that's where the power needs to be. That's where we need to originate everything and then just let it grow like a tree from there. So when you are having these conversations with faculty and when you're in the planning process and we'll, and we'll and I definitely want to get into the program that you put together, what do you think in terms of channels? Are you thinking that a certain channel will fit a certain type of faculty member or employee, or do you have another way that you look at this? So at my institution where we launched the program, we are only training faculty and staff on LinkedIn right now. Okay. Because for us, I didn't want to overwhelm them. And we know LinkedIn is a great professional networking website. So once they learn that and they like it, then we can explore other channels that might be more appropriate for them. I love that. Uh -huh. That's a great foundation because LinkedIn is a very powerful professional network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But from institutional perspective, I do believe that organizations who are interested in being more found in search results should invest in their faculty profiles. Mm -hmm. And those yep. profiles yep. should include their bios, research, interest, video, publications as much as possible on one page. So when somebody's looking for an expert, they come to this page and they have all the information they need, who to contact, even maybe a potential quotes to include in, in whatever uh, the media is looking for. So website is a big one. For academics specifically, there are a lot of different websites like academia.edu yep. where you can get a subscription. And maybe that's something that HR provides to academics a free subscription to academia.edu go ahead publish your research that is um, a heck of a benefit that's and it a doesn't great cost much, benefit right? yeah but then of course i think social media is big especially linkedin for academics i do think x is still still has its place because mm -hmm. a lot of conversation is still happening there mm -hmm. uh, but of course being featured on TV and YouTube shows and podcasts mm -hmm. and publishing research and petitioning and presenting your research in a more interesting way and sharing it on your institutional social media can be also a great way. And I, that's why I think that marketers are well positioned, marketers and communicators are well positioned to lead programs like this because they can help faculty understand what needs to be done and how to get out there and how to talk about their research. So. I think there's so many different ways you can approach this and even creating a personal website. Mm -hmm. Again, there's so many templates you can use. 
WordPress is pretty easy to use. And it's, it's really interesting because one of the things that you know, so first of all, I'm glad I did okay with the website suggestion. But, <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that that we tend to forget, though, is that social media does come into play when it comes into search a lot of times. My, my understanding right now is that TikTok is really, really doing really well when it comes to search and almost acting like somewhat of a search engine. Although I don't know what your feelings are about people in TikTok and academia. I, I get I get the willies about it a little bit because TikTok is such a specific audience. But you you certainly have YouTube and and I just love this suggestion that you made about the institution really offering a subscription to academia as dot edu as a as a benefit, which to me would be an enormous benefit. And so with with all of that being said, you actually have been able to do this. You've been able to uh, do this as a program. So talk about what this looks like as an employee advocacy pro, uh, program. Mm -hmm. So when we think about academic branding, this is more narrow, right? It's more specific for researchers and academics. Mm -hmm. But I do believe this type of program still has place, and I have proven <laughs> that at smaller institutions that are not research-based, like community college, for example. So instead of training researchers, we are training our faculty and staff and leadership to be more present and visible on social, on social media, LinkedIn in particular. And what this program is about, it's when you hear the word employee advocacy program, very often people think that it's a way of tapping into your employees' network and having them publish content on your behalf. But what I'm trying to, to explain to people that this type of activation doesn't really work because people can see through this. So my idea is to help them build their professional brand and to teach them how to post themselves and identify what mm. are the topics they're passionate about and talk about that instead. And if the institutional name comes up in the conversation, that's great, but it's not required. I don't want them to be uh, marketing the institution. I want them to be positioning themselves as experts because that's what will reflect very positively on the institution and help them increase their network and build stronger connections uh, and be more visible, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we did over the last year. It was our pilot year. We launched a program and trained about 20 employees on how to use LinkedIn. And we started with looking at their values, then seeing how their values align with the values of the institution, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then identifying what are their core content pillars? Like, what do they want to be known for? Uh, and we tried to come up with at least three to four different core pillars. And those pillars can also include their personal interests. It doesn't have to be all professional. So if somebody's interested about fitness, for example, I think that's perfectly okay to talk about this as well because it helps you be seen more human and it resonates, right? Because it's all about authenticity. So once they know their core pillars, then we talk about how do you actually create content for LinkedIn, go over different ideas and suggestions, then we do a workshop where they actually create their own content. And then we have a chance to critique, review, suggest improvements. And then we talk about how often to post. And that's usually a big conversation because... I was going to ask <laughs> you about that. Yeah. Yeah. How do you take the mystery out of that? Uh, it, especially when it comes to content creation, in addition right. to how often to post. Because that's one of the things they're very concerned about. Yeah. That it's going to take a lot of time. And what we usually start with is posting one original piece of content a week mm -hmm. and then commenting two to three times on other posts to start mm -hmm. and then see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And then we also coach them through the content creation process to say, it, you don't have to find a dedicated time to sit down and write your posts. <laughs> when something happens, Let's say you just had a great conversation with a student and something happened that you want to share. Talk about that. Obviously, don't name the names, <laughs> FERPA uh, and such, but talk about what is happening on a daily basis. Don't try to force it or come up with something outside of that. And that usually makes it a lot easier for them to yeah. kind of grasp this idea. Because when you say content creation, like, oh, oh, content creation, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's scary. 
but yeah, so kind of slowly getting themselves. And some people stick to it. Some people decide it wasn't right for them and they didn't want to continue. And that's perfectly okay because it is a volunteer-based program. We're not mm-hmm. forcing anyone. So yeah, and what we are planning to do, so now that the first year is over, next year with the people who completed the program will be offering coaching sessions to kind of help them stay motivated and to continue posting because it's really hard on social media. Sometimes it can be lonely and sometimes you can feel like I'm posting all this stuff and no one is commenting, no one is liking, but you just need to realize it takes time, right? It takes consistency, it takes time, growing your audience and being more active. So I think those coaching sessions will be really helpful to keep this momentum going. Uh, especially after the summer break when faculty were on vacation, maybe not posting as much. Uh, so kind of getting them back to schedule. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I joked about TikTok earlier, but th- there I have spoken to faculty who have thought, you know, you say social media to them and they think about what the latest, hottest platform is. And I, and I literally had a faculty member say this to me. He, he said, I don't want to do any TikTok dances. And I said, oh, I didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> He's like, please, <laughs> let's not do that. And then I, I had to explain to that person, well, first of all, we're not going to try to make you get on any particular platform that you don't feel comfortable being a part of. And if you are on a platform, let's look at that one right now and how you can be resourceful and make the best use of your time and your space on that platform while maintaining who you are. You know, yeah, by all means. Let's keep the pictures of the dog. You know, let's uh, let's talk about the date that you had with the wife and all of that great stuff. That's great. Let's do that. Let's figure out if we can mix in some of the academic stuff as well. And and there's some I can think of one in particular who has gotten really good at it. Um, and, and he has done a very good job of mixing his academic life with his personal life, the, the parts he cares to share in either space. And he does a really good job of marrying both of them. And um, and, and now he is just one of the most requested local folks on TV. Um, and so it really works out. But it's great to know that there's a way to take that mystery out of it, especially for those who are at teaching institutions who are teaching. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about myself just as an adjunct. You know, I'm thinking about how much grading I have to do. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, the last thing I want to worry about is content creation right now because I have to grade all these <laughs> assignments. Yeah. What one of the questions I, I I always like to ask folks, and I think we can layer a couple of things in this one. I always like to ask my guests about the way forward when it comes to this sort of thing. What I'm thinking about, and you brought this up to me before we started the call, and I'm so glad you brought it up, is measurement. And so you have an institution right now, you have that marketer who is saying, okay, great, this is a great idea. You have that HR team member who is thinking, yeah, this is a great idea. Marketing HR get together and they decide to start working on this and they want to make it a great talent experience for faculty and, and any staff that might, you know, might be thrown in there as well. How do they measure success? How do they know it is actually working? And I, and I think for some folks, they're going to automatically jump to well, whatever's going to get the enrollment up, that's what we need to do. And some folks are going to say, whatever's going to get the funding up, that's what we need to do. But from where you sit, how does measurement, how do you measure success here? I think that not all meaningful endeavors are easy to measure. <laughs> but there are definitely ways. Thanks for taking the wind out of the sails. <laughs> but there are definitely ways how you can measure it if you have the right goals in place. Yes, so like, depending yes. what, your goal is for your institution, then you can develop metrics to address them. So I'll share some of the things that I'm looking at for Mm -hmm. my particular program. So I wanted to know how many people first completed the program, how many people are active on LinkedIn, and I'm looking at how many impressions they get, how many followers they get over the year. So it kind of gives me a sense of what is that increase in Mm -hmm. visibility for them. We're looking at uh, traffic to the website from LinkedIn in particular, Mm. uh, just to see has it increased, was there more interest, as well as number of followers for our organization on LinkedIn. Uh, Are more people being engaged, et cetera? Let's see. And then anecdotal feedback, like were there any partnership opportunities that have emerged? 
any new connections that somehow benefited the institution. So mm-hmm. I'll give you an example of one of our program managers was looking to launch a program, looking for a faculty member. And he's been searching for a while because it's not easy to find qualified part-time who are very, have a very specific skill mm-hmm. and are in the area. So he's been looking for a while trying to launch this program. And then one day he uh, posted on LinkedIn and he made a connection and he was able to find a faculty the same day. And the program is launching this fall. So looking at anecdotal feedback like this is also important. So let's see. If you are going after media and you are creating those profiles on your website, you can look at traffic to those pages, how well they show up in search results. Did you have more media reaching out to your folks at the institution? I think that's kind of a good starting point. And if you have more specific goals, you can probably tailor more specific metrics. Well, I, and not necessarily that, but he, here's where my mind goes as well. And and I'm really thinking about institutions that may be strapped for resources. Uh, I've worked at three historically black colleges, universities, and and resource was always a big issue. And, you know, um, and so one of the things that would normally come up for folks is, okay, great. You train this faculty member to really, really, you know, on their academic branding. They've done a great job. Thank you. Now you now you created somebody who is so valuable that another institution is going to come along and take them from us. <laughs> and so with do you have any thought? I have my thoughts about this. But for you, when you have those faculty members, and, and surely, surely, I, I'm sure that there has to be someone that you've spoken to and, the, and you could see that the light just came on for them. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, they, they know how valuable they are now. <laughs> and so if, if someone comes to you, if you have a cabinet member or a dean or someone who comes to you and says, you've done such a good job that now we have this other institution trying to poach our people how do you respond to that? Because I think that's the t- that's the other end of this, but it and it and it's kind of a tough conversation. And I know that when when I know within I know how administrators think, you know, when they they see the good result, but they also start thinking about, oh, what's going to happen? So how do you respond to that? I'm curious about your yeah. thoughts. Well, I think first to get to that level of popularity, I would say. (laughs) It takes time, right? So it's not going to happen overnight. It might take years to even become that visible and known for your research because you do have to talk about it often and frequently and in a lot of different channels. So I wouldn't be concerned in a short period of time that people are going to start leaving. The second thing I would say is if somebody wants to leave, they will leave anyway. So you can't really prevent them from leaving. Yeah, you, can't, you, you can't chain them to the gate of the institution, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but what you can do is support them and create an environment where they wouldn't want to leave, mm-hmm. where they feel so good uh, that they just want to stay. And that's where I think our focus should be, is building this type of culture where we support each other and help each other grow. And I'm reading this great book right now. The book is called The Culture Solution. And the author in this book was very interesting. He said that we often think that people come to work for an organization because of the leadership or a specific tasks that they are performing. But really, they see it as a means to achieving a personal goal. Mm. And every person has a different goal in mind. It could be a temporary employment until they start a business, or it could be because they want to take their kid on vacation, or whatever it is, or it could be publishing more and having the flexibility to do the research they are passionate about. So identifying those goals and supporting your employees and helping them fulfill those goals, I think that's what's going to keep them at the institution. And there is nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. To add to your thought, my response to this also is you actually should want a faculty and you should want staff that other institutions want. 
I, I think one of the greatest perspectives I've heard about this is from the, the coach of the Denver Broncos, Sean Payton, who used to be the coach of the New Orleans Saints. And after the Saints won the Super Bowl, my dear Saints, it, he talked about how all of these other teams came after their players and their coaches. And he said, you have to work really hard to keep all these great people. He said, but if you have a bunch of people that nobody else wants, you got a problem. <laughs> and, and, and so the, you know, the other side of that is if you have faculty and staff that other institutions really want, you do, you have, you know, you have a winner. Now, what the, and to your point about how the administration treats those people, that is up to the administration of the institution. And that is something they have to figure out. And that's why I think it's so important to understand how this sort of program benefits the talent experience. Well, Maya, if anybody wanted to reach out to you, of course they can hear you on the Hidden Gem. But if anybody wanted to reach out to you and they have questions for you, how can they reach out to you? I think the best way is to find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active there. I also forgot to mention that I have created a guide for employee advocacy program for higher education. So if in, somebody is interested in doing something like this, I have a guide for you, and Eddie, I will send you a link. Maybe you can put it in show notes for people to download. But yeah, follow me on LinkedIn at Maya Dimishkovich, and yeah, looking forward to talking to you. It is a beautiful thing. Maya Dimishkovich, she is the Chief Marketing Officer for Carroll Community College. She is the host of the Enrollify podcast, The Hidden Gem. Maya, thank you so much for not only joining me on I Want to Work There, but bringing a great idea to I Want to Work There. You're welcome, Eddie. Thank you. I Want to Work There is part of the Enrollify Podcast Network. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea and feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Jamie Hunt, Mallory Wilsey, Seth Odell, Dave Kibbles, Jenny Lee Fowler, and so many other of your favorite leaders in higher ed. And Rollify is made possible by Element 451, the leading AI-powered all-in-one student engagement platform, helping institutions create meaningful, personalized, and engaging interactions with students. Learn more at element451.com.